The West Wing is a television series about a fictional group of White House staffers and their president, Jed Bartlett. Even in your average show, there's quite a bit to unpackage. Its origins, its writers, its characters, its legacy. The way we, Greg and I actually ended up pitching the show is a comedy version of the West Wing. That's sort of what I love about the show, is that they make mistakes, and but they're trying to do the right thing in a very fractious political atmosphere. And I think that informs both Heights and Hamilton. Its influences. To the extent that there may be any West Wing inspiration in what's come after us, uh, baked into that would be everybody who came before us. Uh, Larry Galbart and MASH, Stephen Bochco and Hill Street Blues, uh, uh, so on. It's era. On Tuesday, our country was attacked with deliberate and massive cruelty. And it's heart. And we took to the sky. The history of man is hung on a timeline of exploration, and this is what's next. But when you have a show like The West Wing, one of the most Emmy-nominated shows of all time, and you look at the shows within that upper echelon. As I watched, I became more and more sure of it. There was something happening there. I have never seen such a chain of errors in judgment. I mean, I did what you said. You miss a preeclampsia. You underestimate the fetal weight. Oh, I just am take not. A look at please, it. please, please. Do you think I'd behave like this in your home? It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. Gee. It doesn't work that way. I have patients who are suicidal. Well, they're not going to feel any better about their life if you get clipped. We've been thinking about it, and there's a little something we'd like to give you. It's not much, but it comes from the heart. I don't eat bacon because of the nitrates. No problem. They're artificial. They're made out of soy. They really look out for your health here, don't they? <laughs> and you will never alter drapes in Atlanta again because you do not cross a sugar baker woman. I'm so tired. His art is amazing. Look at that. Let the bears pay the bear tax. I pay the homer tax. That's the homeowner tax. Well, anyway, I'm still outraged. It becomes clear that The West Wing is more than just a good TV show. It is a part of our cultural fabric. Mr. President, welcome back. I find myself often thinking about my favorite scenes and episodes like old friends and memories. What was Josh Lyman, a warning shot? That was my son. I could take any number of them and use them as an example of what the show was about and break down what made it so meaningful to me. But here's my favorite. To give you a little background, in this episode, Chief of Staff Leo McGarry, played by John Spencer, has to publicly admit his past addiction and treatment to alcohol and Valium, which is potentially career ending. It's also the episode where President Bartlett, played by Martin Sheen, first admits to Leo that years prior to running for president that he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, something Bartlett can't hide anymore because he's bedridden with a high fever, which for him is potentially fatal. There's this beautiful dynamic between Leo and the president. They're these old friends that love and trust each other so much. Leo is actually the one who suggested Bartlett run for president in the first place and ran Bartlett's campaign. And despite all the inherent problems with the president having a secret MS diagnosis, the thing that bothers Leo the most is that his friend Jed didn't tell him, because that meant Leo couldn't support him. Their lives are figuratively and literally approaching a cliff, with the president potentially at death's door and Leo about to disgrace his and the president's career. And all Leo cares about is their friendship. When I was lying on my face in the motel parking lot, you were the one I called. In this episode, there's also an escalating tension between two nuclear powers, India and Pakistan, and a State of the Union speech to finish. There's actually this really beautiful sentiment one of the speechwriters, Toby Ziegler, wants to include in the speech. He says, Tomorrow night we do an immense thing. We have to say what we feel. That government, no matter what its past failures, and in times to come, government can be a place where people come together and where no one gets left behind. No one gets left behind. An instrument of good. Then at the end of the episode, the president is speaking with the Secretary of Agriculture. He says, You got a best friend? Yes, sir. 
Would you trust him with your life? Yes, sir. That's your chief of staff. All the while, Leo overhears this from his office. There's a lot going on in any episode of The West Wing. Each episode has multiple plots and often deal with an aspect of the American government. There will likely be some international conflict or crisis, and any number of meetings and press conferences. And there will very frequently be an expression of hope, a romantic ideal for the characters or their country. And at the forefront of all that, friends. I'm not particularly interested in politics or the structure of the American government, but I do know what it is to have a friend that I would trust with my life. That even when it feels like the world is going to end up as cinders in a nuclear war, or my career is over, or I'm lying face down in a parking lot because I'm an alcoholic that relapsed, or I get a disease that's so dangerous that I might fall, that I still have friends and people that love me, that there's always hope. As long as I got a job, you got a job, you understand? And I think that's why I and so many others love the West Wing, what made it part of our cultural fabric, and so influential on television's landscape in its day and times to come, which is how much the characters on the show love and care for each other, and their country, and how much we care for them. That's what brought the show through seven seasons, 95 Emmy nominations, and two presidencies, through the hands of a gifted writer and creator, a talented group of directors and producers, and a dedicated ensemble cast that could have each headlined their own TV show. Because they all believed in the work and each other and reached for the stars. What he did will never, ever, ever be done again. The West Wing originated in the mind and career of Aaron Sorkin. Sorkin's writing career began as a playwright. He wrote his first play and sent it to his old theater teacher, which led to it being performed at Syracuse University in 1984. He then wrote a few off-Broadway plays before writing A Few Good Men, which debuted on Broadway in 1989. Sorkin sold the film rights to the play and wrote the screenplay for Castle Rock Entertainment as his first under contract for the studio. The film was released in 1992. Sorkin then wrote the screenplay for Malice before writing the final screenplay for Castle Rock, a film called The American President. While researching for the film, Sorkin was unable to spend a lot of time with President Bill Clinton and spent most of his time with the White House staff where he earned a great deal of respect for the people and their work. By the time Aaron was done, he turned in a 385-page screenplay to director Rob Reiner before the screenplay was edited to 120 pages. But the 385-page screenplay did not disappear, nor did Aaron's admiration of White House staffers. Years later, Aaron Sorkin was set up to have a meeting with TV producer John Wells, who produced the show ER. Sorkin had no interest in writing for TV, but took the meeting and realized that he would have to pitch something. Sorkin's friend encouraged him to pitch a story about White House staffers, which is exactly what Sorkin did. When I ask what's next, it means I'm ready to move on to other things, so what's next? It's easy to see the footprints of the American president in the West Wing. The American president is a romantic comedy about a widowed president, Andrew Shepard, played by Michael Douglas, who starts dating an environmental lobbyist named Sidney Allen Wade, played by Annette Bening. President Shepard is trying to get re-elected for a second term, and already has a great approval rating, which he hopes to cement with the passage of a crime bill. As the president starts to fall for and date Miss Wade, his points continue to drop and he refuses to comment or allow his staff to comment on the questions the press is asking about their relationship. There are a number of themes or ideas within the film that get repeated in the West Wing. One is the constant fighting for political support. As President Shepard's ratings drop, so do those supporting the passage of his crime bill. Another is the idealized vision of politics. At the end of the film, Shepard gives a speech that denounces his opponents for publicly attacking his girlfriend, while simultaneously pledging support for her environmental bill and rewriting his crime bill to one that works. This is a time for serious people, Bob, and your 15 minutes are up. My name is Andrew Shepard and I am the president. Even though John Wells agreed to back Aaron Sorkin's idea for a show about White House staffers, 
The television landscape of the 90s was not a welcoming place for political television. While there had been political shows on American television prior to the West Wing, like Slattery's People, The Man in the City, Top of the Hill, and The Bold Ones, The Senator, which won five Emmy nominations, it was still thought that you should never make a show about politics. Though the same might not be entirely true for British television, which had a number of political comedies like Yes Minister, The Powers That Be, A Very British Coup, Bill Brand, and more serious dramas like The Politician's Wife and House of Cards. You might think that, Matty. I couldn't possibly comment. John Wells and Aaron Sorkin pitched NBC about a show about relatable White House staffers, which would then show an understanding of how government really works. NBC shared the research they had done that indicated that audiences didn't want or like shows about politics, but agreed to read a pilot script. When Wells brought the West Wing pilot script to NBC, the heads of the studio did not like it and did not want to make it. Additionally, the Monica Lewinsky scandal was breaking, and there were concerns that an audience might not be able to take a show about the White House seriously, so the pilot script remained shelved for a year. Because NBC wanted John Wells to stay on ER, Wells was able to force the studio about a year later to actually make the pilot. And uh, I forced them to make it. The pilot was a powerhouse in the making. What's the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt worship no other God before me. There was Thomas Schlamme, a director who had worked with Sorkin on his first TV show, Sports Night. Sorkin had written the pilots for The West Wing and Sports Night at the same time, and while West Wing was shelved, Sports Night was picked up. Schlamme has been described by the actors on The West Wing as an actor's director. Richard Schiff, who plays Toby Ziegler on the show, said that he used to have healthy fights with Schlamme, presenting challenging ideas and, out of that discussion, creating a collaborative environment. Schiff had a number of strong opinions about his character or the text, and he would voice them to everyone. At some point, Schiff noticed people walking away when he did so, so he stopped. Two weeks into this silence, Schlamme knocked at his trailer door and asked, Are you all right? I went, yeah, why? He goes, why aren't you fighting with me? I miss our fights. He goes, I learn more about what we do and what we're doing by you challenging me. If you stop, I am not going to be as good. He's a remarkable man, actually, and, uh, and quite a phenomenal director. You can see what's happening in, in the human being that's creating the role. He does just, it's not a puppet show for him. And he realized that I was off I wasn't doing what I do. And he was saying, I appreciate the way you work. You know, not everybody does, but he, he does. Shlami had earned Sorkin's trust when working with him on Sports Night, finding ways to respect Sorkin's words while creating ways to make them work even better. And Shlami was not afraid to go over budget if it meant creating something greater. The main cast they hired, for the most part, were actors who not only had experience in television and movies, but had a strong background in the theater. Bradley Whitford, who played Josh Lyman, the deputy chief of staff and chief political advisor, had roles in a number of off-Broadway and Broadway productions, including roles in Sorkin's 1989 run of A Few Good Men. In fact, Sorkin had actually written the role with Whitford in mind. John Spencer, who played chief of staff Leo McGarry, had been part of a number of stage productions going back to 1978. When casting for Leo's part, Sorkin said, we need someone like John Spencer, and Shlami said, what about John Spencer? Allison Janney, who played White House Press Secretary C.J. Craig, had done seven off-Broadway productions and two Broadway productions, and quickly became every cast member's favorite actor to work across. Whatever comes out of this woman is so honest and so uh, beautiful and honest that we're just swept away. Richard Schiff, who played Toby Ziegler, the White House Communications Director, was originally an artistic director of the Manhattan Repertory Theater and directed off-Broadway productions. Even the show's titular role, President Jed Bartlett, was played by Martin Sheen, who had a tremendous amount of Broadway and off-Broadway work, in addition to his already legendary body of work. Rob Lowe, who played Sam Seaborn, the Deputy White House Communications Director, only had one Broadway performance under his belt. This is the first in a series of differences between Rob Lowe and the rest of the cast. Initially, Sorkin did not want an established star for the role of Sam Seaborn, while the studio was concerned about putting more attractive actors into the cast. Casting low appeased the network's needs and allowed the hiring of the other cast they wanted. 
The importance of the work in theater is that theater is the basis for Aaron Sorkin's writing. Even today, Sorkin says he is most comfortable writing plays. If you look at Sorkin's work, the most common scene is two people talking in a room. This is why it is so crucial to have people who are both comfortable with and love theater work. Because then you get Richard Schiff and John Spencer fostering an environment where there was a lot of rehearsal, which allowed the actors to properly inhabit the work. There are a lot of terms and ideas on the West Wing that can be quite dense, and it serves to give the actors a chance not only to work through it, but to work through how they feel about it. Hey, Kratom, my day old peel. Leo's not talking about the portion being accounted for as off-budget, and particularly not the long-term capital outlays. Here's where you lose me. It also helps having a director who both respects the work and only wants to make it better. The West Wing was notorious for the walk and talk, a long take that appears to be a single continuous shot of two or more characters walking. The West Wing was far from the first series to do the walk and talk. The Steadicam had been around long before the West Wing. But it quickly became synonymous with the West Wing. And the first walk and talk was in the pilot. Tommy Shlami's idea was to take the first eight scenes and make them a walk and talk to show the geography of the West Wing. The walk and talks had the feel of a stage performance. By having a series of scenes back to back, it was like a stage production where scenes pile on, one after the other, until intermission. Since Sports Night, the walk and talk was a way of making Sorkin's default style of two people talking in a room more dynamic. And the walk and talk became such a staple of the show that it became notorious for it. Save the seat. Donna. I used to drink. I drank. I was drunk. Leo, we should consider the seats. Consider the seats. Lang will move. Donna. My ex is a hooker. Still, initial screenings of the pilot were not going well. Executives at NBC were concerned they had a show about politics where characters mostly talked. The show's production company, Warner Brothers Television, created new demographics in order to sell the show to NBC. Households earning more than $75,000 per year households with at least one college graduate, households that subscribe to the New York Times, and households with internet access. These demographics not only helped get the show on the air, but helped get the show ad sponsors like BMW and tech companies advertising during the dot-com boom era. When The West Wing debuted in 1999, it was an extremely competitive landscape for television. It had to contend with strong sitcoms like Friends, Frasier, and Everybody Loves Raymond. Emmy Darlings like ER and NYPD Blue, a burgeoning Sopranos, as well as the monolith of television that year, Blade, who wants to be a millionaire? and JAG. Anything I can do for you, sir? Uh, no, thank you, sweetie. Uh, uh, Petey, pe Petty. JAG was a legal drama oh. that ran for 10 years. Is this one of those um, ESP moments? No, sir. It was about a guy from the Navy with that hat and your boy watched every single episode. <laughs> you know that for a fact? Yeah! <laughs> but the show had a lot of talent behind it and was able to acquire more. Because Aaron Sorkin was the principal writer for the series, in the early years, the producers would spend that money that would normally have gone to writers on directors. A lot of times this would involve bringing up directors who Tommy Shlami or Sorkin knew, who had directed on Sports Night. Directors like Alex Graves, Robert Berlinger, Don Scardino, and Brian Gordon. According to Shlami, Alex Graves in particular had a massive visual vocabulary. Shlami would watch Graves' work and incorporate things Graves did in his own work. There were also directors who were not from Sports Night who came to work on the show. Directors who went on to have quite prodigious careers like Alan Taylor, who went on to direct episodes of Mad Men, Rome, Game of Thrones, Lost, and Six Feet Under. And directors like Clark Johnson, who directed episodes of NYPD Blue, Law and Order, The Wire, Homeland, and The Walking Dead. Despite the show's prestigious cast and crew, the show received endless criticism. One of the criticisms of the show is that all the characters are interchangeable with one another. So, tell me what the problem is, Toby. Uh, I'm Sam, sir. Toby is like that misfit in a group of friends. You love him, but he's so frequently annoying that you kind of hate him, too. It's like that friend who's the asshole, but he's our asshole. Mm -hmm. Toby is the absolute moral center of the show. He pushes everyone around him to a moral high ground, especially when they don't want to be pushed. Which is actually kind of funny now that I think about how Richard Schiff had all those healthy fights with Tommy Shlami. 
Schiff described Toby as, I thought he was someone who was formulating and ruminating and, and gurgling like a volcano, you know what I mean, until he had to speak and he had to say something. Introspective to a point of almost self-loathing. It's as if the reason Toby tries to be so good is that's the only value he'll see in himself. One of my favorite Toby scenes is when he gets drunk in season five and starts singing the theme from M.A.S.H. Because of course, Suicide is Painless is what Toby sings when he's drunk. Suicide is painless. Then there's Josh. Josh is a petulant child. He's often the smartest person in the room and he's dying to show it. He thinks he's handsome, funny, and God's gift to everything. And it doesn't help that some people tend to see him that way too. LemonLimon.com? You have fans, Josh. Not many of them from the looks of it, but what they lack in numbers, they more than make up for in fervor. And yet, more than anyone else, he's reliant on the people around him. It's like growing up, he was always so far ahead of everyone else that it made it difficult to notice signposts for maturity along the way. And his mind and ability took him so far ahead of the pack that he never got to slow down and notice what he was missing. I'm a graduate of Harvard and Yale. And I believe that my powers of debate can rise to meet the Socratic wonder that is the White House press corps. Leo is the most weathered among the staff. He's the boss, not just by title, but by example. What would Leo do? He's a war veteran who survived the Korean War. Sometimes there's this authoritative quality to people from the military. They've been trained in so much and for so much that they have an ease and confidence about them. If you can survive being dragged on your friend's back for days, your threshold for what concerns you is quite high. And if you're a relapsing alcoholic that's able to pick yourself up off the pavement of a parking lot and chase sobriety and life again, then you have an even deeper well of life and experience and struggle to draw upon. You can sign the president's name? Yeah. On a document removing him from power and handing it to someone else? Yeah. CJ Craig probably changes the most over the series. She starts as the press secretary and becomes the chief of staff. It's a bit of a weird transition and I can't help but wonder if they had CJ do it not because the character was qualified, but because the showrunners were confident Alice and Janney had the acting chops to take on anything. What happened to your cheeks? I had root canal. Why are you talking like that? I had root canal. CJ's character is actually a little harder to pin down. Like the other characters, she has a strong moral center she has playful relationships with most of the other characters, and she has this kind of supreme confidence at times. Handling people requires an enormous skill set, and CJ seems to often be at ease not because she can handle any situation, but because, if she needs to, she can handle the people in them. The possible use of taxpayer resources to defraud the public. I feel like Sam Seaborn is the heart of the show. The West Wing is a Frank Capra-esque version of politics. Frank Capra's work was often so sweetly idealized that it was saccharine. Capra was a director of films like It's a Wonderful Life, It Happened One Night, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Capra's films not only presented more hopeful, idealized versions of the world, but also had the ability to elicit emotion from the viewer. And you know that you fight for the lost causes harder than for any others. Yes, you even die for them. And more than any other character, Sam always seems to inhabit these qualities. This country is an idea, and one that's lit the world for two centuries, and treason against that idea is not just a crime against the living. In fact, Rob Lowe always thought that Sam was an idealized version of Aaron. He seems to be the most naive of the characters, but only because his hope outweighs his street sense. Josiah Jed Bartlett may be the most interesting character on the show. He is probably the most intelligent of the group, he scored 1590 out of 1600 on his SATs, twice, was a tenured professor, and received a Nobel Prize in economics. He is a passionate man, so much so that he's sometimes temporarily ruled by them. He cares deeply about people and the state of the world. And when the safety of the world or its people are at risk, particularly Americans and especially those close to him, he is furious. He is also devoutly Catholic, I think his Catholicism is actually more of a burden to him than a solace. His life is in a constant state of crisis, overwhelmed by the injustices and dangers of the world. And I think a part of his moral center is tied to his religion, 
as he tries and fails to play the role of a just God. He seems to be two men, as Toby puts it. The absent-minded professor with the awe dad sense of humor. Disarming, unthreatening, good for all time zones. And the Nobel laureate, still searching for salvation, lonely, frustrated, lethal. There's a very patriarchal sense to him in a lot of ways, not just in his awe dad demeanor, but also in how he may remind the audience of their own fathers. Seeing, at times, a caring individual, and when pushed to a corner, the most ferocious force we will ever see or experience in our lives. Is that how I just lost nine guys to a damn street gang with a ham radio? Like all West Wing fans, I have a number of favorite scenes or episodes. What in God's name is happening right now? Like the episode Excelsius Deo, where Toby discovers a homeless veteran who dies in a park and arranges an honor guard funeral for him. There's this storytelling technique I once mentioned in my Steven Spielberg video, Intimacy and Character. It's not the only way or the required way to establish a connection between a character and the audience, but it can be a very effective way. In these moments, you almost give a soliloquy to the character, where they reveal a deeply personal story about themselves. It also helps to tie this story to what the character needs or wants, or situates their personality for the viewer so they intrinsically know how the character will react in the rest of the story. Aaron Sorkin is a skilled practitioner of this technique. I don't know why you've always been interested in my adoption history, but you said it's not like someone looked at me and gave me back, but that is what happened. Like in this episode where Mrs. Landingham is explaining to Charlie about her general malaise with Christmas and the loss of her sons. So they joined up as medics, and four months later they were pinned down during a fight in Da Nang and were killed by enemy fire. There's this easygoing, plain-spoken nature to it. When you're aiming to pluck people's emotional strings, it sometimes helps to be direct and not too wordy. It's hard when that happens so far away, you know, because with the noises and the shooting, they had to be so scared. So when Mrs. Landingham shows up as Toby is about to go to the funeral he set up using the president's name, even after chewing him out for doing so and says, I'd like to come along. We're not surprised. We've followed the character's soliloquy where they've expressed what they want. In this case, another chance to spend Christmas with her boys. And now we are rooting for her to get it. Or the episode where Bartlett and his staff are reconsidering the death penalty for one particular case, and perhaps for the country as a whole. At the end, there's a scene where Bartlett's priest from when he attended church as a young man comes to visit him in the Oval Office. As Bartlett complains about praying for wisdom and receiving none, Father Kavanaugh tells him, You remind me of the man that lived by the river. He heard a radio report that the river was going to rush up and flood the town, and that all the residents should evacuate their homes. But the man said, I'm religious, I pray. God loves me. God will save me. The waters rose up. A guy in a rowboat came along and he shouted, Hey you, you in there. The town is flooding. Let me take you to safety. But the man shouted back, I'm religious, I pray. God loves me, God will save me. A helicopter was hovering overhead and a guy with a megaphone shouted, Hey you, you down there, the town is flooding. Let me drop this ladder and I'll take you to safety. But the man shouted back that he was religious, that he prayed, that God loved him and that God will take him to safety. Well, the man drowned. And standing at the gates of St. Peter, he demanded an audience with God Lord, he said, I'm a religious man. I pray. I thought you loved me. Why did this happen? God said, I sent you a radio report, a helicopter, and a guy in a rowboat. What the hell are you doing here? I love these Sorkin stories. Whether he has written them himself or borrowed them, they are their own fables in the Sorkin universe. Fables are some of our oldest stories, passed down from person to person, generation to generation. There's a kind of universal and ageless humanity to them. Sang and danced and offered prayers to the gods for a successful hunt so that they could survive just one more unimaginably brutal winter. Even as they age, they do not grow old. They remain meaningful. 
This guy's walking down the street when he falls in the hall. The walls are so steep he can't get out. And Sorkin has a way of making his own fables throughout much of his work. The most efficient animal on the planet is a condor. The most inefficient animals on the planet are humans. Which ties us to his work the same way fables tie us all together. Another one of my favorite scenes is the intro to the episode Galileo. It's an almost perfectly condensed version of what makes the early seasons of The West Wing great. The first is that quality that some TV shows have where you become so involved or enamored with a show's characters that they feel like friends. What? I lost my shoe. Sometimes I think this is an aspect of the show where the characters or the style of the show becomes very familiar. Sometimes I think the viewer takes a role in this relationship, whether by binge watching or watching the show at a time in their lives when, for whatever reason, they could use a friend. It helps to have fully formed characters with well-defined characteristics or tendencies, so their interactions become a sort of game where the rules and systems are well known to the viewer. Like how the president has a love for seemingly meaningless information, and an even greater love for talking about them. Everglades National Park is the largest remaining subtropical wilderness in the continental United States and... And how the rest of the staff is thoroughly unenthused by either of these passions. This is where the episode Galileo begins, with the president talking about the many exciting names NASA has created in the past, and CJ's inability or unwillingness to take part. Say it again. Your imagination like a child will explode with unrestrained possibilities for adventure. Galileo 5. You didn't say it right. A joke that gets expanded upon when the president is showing off his Mars knowledge despite CJ's protests. And it moves to Sam, the loudest beating heart of inspiration in the series, making an off-the-cuff, beautiful speech that not only acknowledges the information of the Galileo 5 spacecraft, while simultaneously adding that inspirational spirit of the show that expands the surface-level material into a greater dialogue and hope for America and humanity before giving us a punchline. And to chronicle the extraordinary voyage of an unmanned ship called Galileo 5. He said it right. And of course, I love the most celebrated West Wing episode, Two Cathedrals. Everything about the episode builds. The pressure the entire White House staff is under as they are about to reveal to the country for the first time that the president was hiding his multiple sclerosis. The funeral for the president's surrogate older sister and secretary, Mrs. Landingham. The president's rant against God. The constant question of whether or not the president will run for re-election. The flashback to the beginning of Bartlett's and Mrs. Landingham's relationship. The impending tropical storm. That moment when, because the president refuses his jacket, Charlie takes off his. A father that hits his son. And in that betrayal of family, a woman that says, You never had a big sister and you need one. It all builds this moment where the president is about to give his first speech since the announcement of his MS. This isn't just a scene echo where, when he was young, Mrs. Landingham figured out that when Jed puts his hands in his pockets, he decides something. It's a sequence that takes all the momentum building up through the episode and adds that tension and excitement to the movement of the camera in order to accentuate the question, will the president run for re-election? The camera swivels around the reporter who CJ has arranged is not going to ask the question about re-election and leaving space in the frame behind him so that when we go back, we can see the president is seeking that re-election question. The reporter from behind that pops up in the empty space in the frame. The faces of our leads in anticipation, a slight zoom in on them all. And then in the next frame, you break up the repetition because the moment cannot stand still and you swivel Leo's head around in the front of the frame. It's a movement that demands our attention, not only because of how Leo moves in the frame, but how the camera moves around him and the additional movement of the American flag and the storm in the window behind them. Because next to the recently deceased Mrs. Landingham, Leo knows the president best, and he can announce to Toby, he knows the president is about to do something remarkable. And then we get the movement on the president, who appeared weak the entire episode, watching his hand go in his pocket, then circling behind and around his head like a hero shot. This ground holds the graves of people who died for it, who gave what Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. There's this unrelenting quality to the spirit of America. Two days after the Boston Marathon, 
the Boston Bruins were set to play the Buffalo Sabres at home. The coach of the Bruins said before the game, We have the ability to help people heal and find some reason to smile again by representing our city properly. As Rene Rancourt began to sing the national anthem, you see and began to hear the crowd take over. So Everyone began singing. An entire arena of Boston citizens, in one voice, said, No matter what terror befalls us, we will not be discouraged. We will stand together and stand tall. I've seen this video many times and always find new faces to look at. Some people just singing along as though pulled by the force around them. Others with a near militaristic seriousness. Some holding on to their loved ones in this moment of solidarity and pride. It's a remarkable little moment for America, but it is not unique to its history. The national anthem itself was created with the same sentiment of the audience in that hockey game. The author of the anthem, which began as a poem, was Francis Scott Key, a lawyer who was in Chesapeake Bay during an attack on Baltimore in the War of 1812. Key was on a vessel in the bay as the British attacked Fort Henry. From there, he witnessed the attack from a distance as the British fired shells on the fort all night in what Key referred to as a sheet of fire and brimstone. In the morning, Key wrote, a bright streak of gold mingled with crimson shot athwart the eastern sky, followed by another and still another as the morning sun rose. And he was able to see that the fort still, defiantly, flew the American flag. I know that, like a lot of American history from this era, this poem that eventually became America's national anthem is not without its problems. But it touches on this unrelenting quality of the American spirit. In the book, Land of Hope, An Invitation to the Great American Story by Wilfred M. McClay, he writes, Nothing about America better defines its distinctive character than the ubiquity of hope. A sense that the way things are initially given to us cannot be the final word about them. That we can never settle for that. Even those who are bitterly critical of America and finds its hope to be delusions cannot deny the enduring energy of those hopes and are not immune to their pull. From the ancient Greek tales of the island of the blessed, a winterless land to the west, filled with heroes, gods, and the Elysian fields, to the self-rule of the English colonists, to the Massachusetts Minutemen who sought to maintain that self-rule against British interference, to the Quaker's colony established in what was eventually called Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, a place for freedom of worship for Christians, Catholics, and Judaism. America has always exemplified a fresh hope for renewal. On September 11, 2001, Allison Crowther's phone recorded a message from her son. Mom, this is well. I, I want you to know that I'm okay. Flight 175 had just struck the South Tower. 24-year-old Wells was an equities trader and former volunteer firefighter. In the lobby of the 78th floor, Wells said in a strong, authoritative voice, Everyone who can stand, stand now. If you can help others, do so. He led survivors down 17 flights of stairs while carrying an injured woman on his back, and then went back up into the crumbling building. They found his body amongst the rubble, in what appeared to be a command post in the tower lobby, presumably established to help others. One year later, 15 days after the 9-11 anniversary, NBC aired an episode of The West Wing. Two pipe bombs were set off inside the Geiger Indoor Arena, which is the swimming team's facility at Kennison State University. In the episode, President Bartlett gives a speech in which he talks about sustaining hope in this winter of anxiety and fear. He talks about how some of the swimmers, having heard the explosion, ran into the fire to help get people out. Ran into the fire. He says, every time we think we have measured our capacity to meet a challenge, we look up 
and we're reminded that that capacity may well be limitless. This is a time for American heroes. We will do what is hard. We will achieve what is great. This is a time for American heroes, and we reach for the stars. The West Wing not only delivers a message of hope for its fictitious world, it's a hope that mirrors our own. And carried a woman on his shoulders down 17 flights. Then he went back. In its seven years and beyond, the show is a beacon that suggests the best is still in us, no matter how far away it seems. That hope is boundless, as long as we remember to help and love one another. There's this irreversible tie between the fictional world of the West Wing and real-world politics, both the politics of its day and all administrations to come. Some people see the West Wing as an indulgent, idealistic, left-wing fantasy that provided an escape for Democrats in the years where George W. Bush was president. Some went as far to measure the West Wing as a tool for students to have a better framework for understanding political knowledge and political theory. Some have troubles with the realism of the West Wing's politics, how it portrays things like, by winning the debate, you've won the whole election. Some see the West Wing as encouraging triangulation, a middle ground where you appeal to voters and policies from both opposing parties, which results in less ambitious policy. Some say that by the nature of drama, the West Wing simplifies or even glorifies the idea that being morally right or persuasive can affect change in politics like in season five when they solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It doesn't help that the actors on the West Wing themselves are actively involved in politics. On October 15th, 2020, HBO Max released a West Wing reunion with Michelle Obama, Bill Clinton, and Lin-Manuel Miranda. The reunion was to support When We All Vote, a program made to encourage voter participation. In October 2016, Richard Schiff, Allison Janney, Bradley Whitford, Dulé Hill, Joshua Molina, and Mary McCormick helped campaign for Hillary Clinton. Around that same time, in an interview with MSNBC, Bradley Whitford said, There's no doubt in my mind that Hillary would be President Bartlett's choice. Nobody is more prepared to take that position on day one. I know this might be controversial, but on behalf of Jed Bartlett, I want to endorse Hillary Clinton. In making a show about politics, it was also next to impossible not to make a commentary, though sometimes indirectly, on the politics of the day. Like the episodes in the fourth season that deal with genocide in the fictional nation of Kundu, an obvious nod to the genocide in Rwanda, or the confrontation between Governor Ritchie and Jed Bartlett at the end of season three. Bartlett accuses Ritchie of being unengaged, and Ritchie accuses Bartlett of being superior, an academic elitist, and a snob. Their confrontation is reminiscent of the Gore-Bush election in 2000. During the election, Bush was presented as the kind of plain-spoken, manly candidate. There was a photo op of him during the campaign, clearing brush from his farm. Aaron Sorkin felt that during the Bush-Gore campaigns, there was a glamorization of lack of curiosity and a demonization of being an intellectual. He placed this feeling into the bartlett Ritchie scene. It's why the crux of the scene revolves around when Bartlett tells Richie about the murder of a Secret Service man, and Richie says, Crime? Boy, I don't know. Bartlett tells him that, In the future, if you're wondering, crime, boy, I don't know, is when I decided to kick your ass. There's also a dedication to a realistic context of the show. The show employed a number of former White House staff, like communications director George Stephanopoulos, and White House Press Secretary D.D. Myers, who were often consulted about specific issues or items while writing the show. When there's so much blurring of the lines between the fictional world of the West Wing and real-world politics, it's almost impossible to separate the two. Something that's made more difficult by how successful the show was. And there becomes an expectation that one should be in service of the other. Would the West Wing work today? I don't know. Would Jag? <laughs> The real question is, does the show work dramatically? Of course, as with all media, I think it's important to consider the show's era and context, but I'm not sure the politics are what people loved about the show. At its heart, The West Wing is not a show about politics. Yes, because the characters are White House staffers, and they're almost always in the White House, politics is the context for 90% of the show. But the show seeks to humanize the staff, 
to make relatable the kinds of questions and challenges people in the upper echelon of American politics would face, to address who they are, how they feel about things, and most importantly, how they feel about each other. You got a best friend? One of my favorite relationships on the West Wing is between President Bartlett and his body man and personal aide, Charlie. Charlie is a bright young man who recently lost his mother just before he joined the White House staff. We don't really know what happened to his father, just that he's not in Charlie's life anymore and has not been for some time. The president naturally fills this parental void in Charlie's life. In fact, this bond extended beyond the screen, as when Martin Sheen met Dulé Hill for the first time, he taught Dulé the handshake that Lawrence Fishburne had taught him during Apocalypse Now. Charlie and the President have the most familial relationship on the show, because while Charlie's absolute loyalty and devotion to the President is somewhat part of the job, Charlie sees him as more than that. In Season 5, when Charlie feels like the President has been threatened, he exclaims, Charlie, I would never- He's not just the President! But what he means is, he's my father. There's this scene where the Secret Service are locking down the Oval Office, and Charlie overpowers Secret Service men from another part of the West Wing all because he thinks someone might have hurt his father. And when he shows up, Bartlett's face is so proud. And then he reassures his son. In perhaps the most powerful scene on the show, Bartlett sends Charlie on this unending mad quest to get a new carving knife, forcing Charlie to buy a new knife, inspecting it, rejecting it, and sending Charlie to go and research and find another knife. Near the end of the episode, Charlie has finally had enough and confronts the president on the importance of this knife. Bartlett explains that it isn't just a knife for cutting meat. It's something we pass down through our family and generations. Charlie, my father gave this to me and his father gave it to him. And now I'm giving it to you. It isn't just a symbolic gesture that Bartlett considers Charlie a son. It's filling a space that Charlie no longer has in his life. To have someone we look up to not just as an authority figure, but as a role model and hero. And have them tell us that they're proud. I'm proud of you, Charlie. Thank you, sir. The bond amongst the staff is more than mere friendship. Even at a normal nine to five job, those people become a family of sorts. Are you gonna listen to me from now on? I'm not even listening to you now. Because this is a sometimes 6 a.m. to midnight job, sometimes a six days straight job, that work family bond becomes deeper because no one else really fits into these people's lives. Everyone else at best are visitors. So when Josh receives an NSC card that protects him from a nuclear attack and he realizes none of the other senior staff got one, he cannot abide it. He says, I want to be a comfort to my friends in tragedy and I want to be able to celebrate with them in triumph. And for all the times in between, I just want to be able to look them in the eye. Leo, it's not for me. I want to be with my friends, my family, and these women. Josh tells CJ about his card, listening to Ave Maria, the song his sister listened to all the time in her room, before she died in a fire one night while babysitting him. The transference of the importance of family is a seamless one for him. He cannot, will not, leave his loved ones in a blazing inferno to die ever again, even hypothetically. Then of course, there's the paternal way that Bartlett watches over them all. In the flashback scene where Bartlett was running for president, he visits Josh at the airport when Josh's father has died. In the flashbacks up until this moment, Bartlett has been quite dismissive with Josh and the rest of the people on the campaign. But in this scene, he not only comforts Josh, but tries to take care of him, like a father. Until this moment, Bartlett had told Leo that he wasn't ready to become the president. But after this instance, he says, Leo. Yeah. I'm ready. And I think it's because the mantle of President of the United States carries so much responsibility, much more so than becoming a father. In a sense, he must now take care of everyone. And if he's able to take care of Josh, then maybe he's able to take care of everyone else, too. And don't think I don't know your value. And I'll never make you think I don't again. As high-minded and idealistic as the show appears to be, there are times when it falls short of its promises, particularly in its treatment of women. It could be a product of its time, some of these things you wouldn't say on television today, or it could be a product of its author. 
Either way, there's an occasional casual misogyny to the show. Like how Donna often takes the role of the person who doesn't know anything, so it must be explained to them. I don't know what that means. Someone from the line of succession. Essentially what they're saying is we want to give back the money. Yes. Why don't we want to give back the money? Because we're Democrats. It's a stamp. I understand that it's a stamp, but I'm saying that when it comes to statehood for Puerto Rico, the United States has to remain neutral. Or the scene in season one where Josh gives CJ a report on sex education and tells her to pay attention to certain pages. Or when Sam says he would watch Carol have sex with CJ on the couch. Or the multiple scenes in season three where Leo hits on his lawyer. Or when Sam says, Hayes, you can make a good dog break his leash. Or when Bartlett refers to Ainsley Hayes as a blonde sex kitten. A lot of people assumed you were hired because you were a blonde Republican sex kitten. Sometimes these elements even creep into the idealistic message of the show. Like when Ainsley receives a harassment plant from someone and Sam gets to be the big strong hero that goes and makes it right. And while Ainsley is mousy at times, when things matter, she doesn't seem to have any problem standing up for herself. Is Sam Seaborn lying? Lying's an awfully strong word. Do you? Yes, he's lying. Then later, the staff shows up in Ainsley's office singing, For He Is An Englishman, in a show of solidarity and unity in their mutual dedication to duty. It's a warm, heartfelt sentiment, but to get there, Ainsley had to be harassed and protected when she could have easily stood up for herself. It's not a constant, every single episode problem, but it's not great. You demeaned her. No, we're friends. It's a completely mature, you know, also she started it. Not long after Aaron Sorkin's masterclass came out, I purchased it. I originally got it to create a different video, but now it offers some additional insight into Sorkin's work. So I'd like to apply just a couple of these lessons to the Emmy award-winning episode from the second season, Noel in which Josh talks to a psychiatrist who diagnoses him with PTSD. In a previous episode that season, Josh had been shot and has since been reliving the shooting, particularly when he hears loud music, which he associated with sirens. According to Sorkin, every story begins with intention and obstacle. The greater the obstacle, the better. One ring to rule them all. In the beginning of the episode, Josh is called into a room with Dr. Stanley Keyworth, a trauma psychiatrist. Much like Josh, at first we were just trying to figure out what he is doing there. Immediately, Josh seems confrontational, accusing the doctor of lying to him and flexing his position and intellect. But the doctor flexes right back, catching an instance when Josh has lied. This is expanded upon in the scene following the intro, and it's a little subtle in the beginning, but the intention and obstacle is still clear. Josh doesn't want to be in the room with a psychiatrist and wants to keep his problems and his truth to himself and the doctor wants to reveal Josh's problems and truth. Josh may have a prestigious job and massive intellect, but the psychiatrist can tell when he's lying. You're not talking to the paperboy either, Josh. One of the other things Sorkin discusses is launching from one scene to the next. This isn't a hard rule, but the idea is that you ask a question in one scene that gets answered in the next. The episode Noel doesn't follow this rule completely, particularly when establishing its B-plot, a story about a painting. But it does follow it quite well. In the first sequence after the intro with Josh and Dr. Stanley Keyworth, Stanley asks, what happened three weeks ago? Which takes us into a flashback of what happened three weeks ago. Just as an aside, this is the first time we see the music that's triggering Josh's PTSD. And watch the unsettling way the camera spins around them. It makes us uncomfortable without telling us why. I love that. And at the end of the scene, Josh mentions to Toby something the energy secretary did, which causes Toby to go to Sam and Sam to go to CJ. Here in the press briefing with CJ, we get the question from a reporter about a woman screaming at a painting, setting up the B-plot, while also setting up the next scene where Sam and CJ discuss people going crazy on White House tours. At the end of the scene, Josh comes from behind CJ and says the president is in the situation room. What's going on? Something about a pilot. Now is a good chance to talk about another lesson Sorkin teaches about a character that knows as little as the audience does. This character allows the audience to learn what they need to know more seamlessly. Nine times out of 10 on the West Wing, this role falls to Donna. But it's very interesting that here in the Situation Room, that role falls to the President. 
What does that mean? Is he in there alone? Is there a crew? Did he crash? Is there a chance he's trying to contact the ground and can't? Don't our fighter pilots have to go through some kind of psychological testing? Well, they go. Let me ask a ridiculous question. I know the answer is no, but is there any way to bring this plane down without shooting it down? From these interactions, we're left with a question. What are we going to do with the pilot? This connects into asking Josh about the pilot. One of the great things about this method of storytelling is that it works very well within the episode because it allows a seamless jumping between recollection and the discussion in the present with Josh and Stanley. Because Stanley asks what Josh's assignment was with the pilot and we immediately jump to Josh getting that assignment from Leo. One of the other things Sorkin discusses in his masterclass is Aristotle's poetics. According to Sorkin, the rules of story come from Aristotle's 2300-year-old work Poetics, which is a text about dramatic theory. What Aristotle says about drama and story and poetics has been contested over the years, with plenty who agree with the rules Aristotle discusses, and plenty who disagree. While there are many who contest what Aristotle was saying in the first place. One theory I read online was what Aristotle says about catharsis. Catharsis is a purification of the soul through pity and fear. The metaphor here would be ceremonial purification. In other words, the arousal of pity and fear in the spectator purifies the spirit, leaving it serene and pure. At the end of Noel, Josh has gone through a very difficult struggle of admitting how he cut his hand, as well as a realization that, In your head, music is the same thing as, as sirens. There's this touching talk between Leo and Josh, one of Sorkin's fables about friendship. And Donna takes Josh out of the White House to take him to the emergency room. As they leave, they pass carolers singing and ringing their bells. Josh stares at them somewhat distantly, mesmerized, and is again reliving the shooting. The entire episode has been a journey with Josh, struggling with him in therapy to uncover his pain. We've been through this whole process. Now, amplified by Sorkin's fable of friendship, we get one last moment to experience Josh's pain, even after all that difficult work to see that he's still trapped there. At Christmas time, no less. A time of hope and renewal. And in that moment, we pity him and those like him. And perhaps in that moment, we not only appreciate the storytelling journey, but we purge that pity from our soul. There's also a kind of energizing quality to Sorkin's work. There's this intersection of character, moral or ethical ideal, and rousing speech. The ideas and scenes all lead to a seminal moment where a speech ultimately and completely defines a character or a theme of the work. In a Sorkin work, the speech is everything. I'm tired of being Ringo when I know I was John. Everybody loves Ringo. It doesn't hit every episode or every moment of the West Wing, but it is most certainly present. There's this moment in the episode, 20 Hours in America, where Sam Seaborn admits he stole part of his speech from Camelot, a Broadway production from 1961, starring Richard Burton and Julie Andrews, about the fabled King Arthur. At the end of the play, a despondent King Arthur meets a young boy, Tom, who wants to be a knight of the round table and believes in Camelot's ideals. Arthur realizes Tom can carry on the ideals he once had if he spreads the story of Camelot. There are times, perhaps, when the West Wing is at its best, when it speaks to us as though we are Tom. Government can be a place where people come together. There is a thread of plays throughout Sorkin's work. Plays have been the center of Sorkin's world since he saw Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf as a boy. More than other art forms, theater has a reliance on the written word. Theater can have music and innovative staging, but for the most part, the words and the performances must convey the play's meaning. There are no close-ups for intimacy, no hero shots, no cutting between sequences to build tension. It's all out there naked on the stage. Perhaps that's part of why Sorkin's words are so important to him, because they are so important to a play. It's also why empowering speeches are so often the crescendo of his works, because words have the power. Without them, there is no kindling an actor can use to make us feel. And it's also why references to plays are littered through Sorkin's works and characters, because they are what make him feel. Camelot. She's a kid at the end of Camelot. The other important thing to note about Sorkin's work is its beautiful blend of drama and comedy. In an episode of The West Wing, he'll deal with the most intense interpersonal drama between two characters, 
while offsetting it with characters working on writing jokes for a speech. The interchange between the two tones helps each other, and not only creates better drama, but some of the most enduring humor I've experienced in a show. How long are they gonna be? A couple more minutes. Please. Psychics at Caltech and the Fermi National Accelerator Lab are close to announcing what- Physicists. Like Theoretical physicists. And so we are working at building with the smartest people in the world. It's difficult not to look at the talents of Sorkin and those around him and see that as the reason why, despite the odds, they succeeded in making a popular political show. In November of 2001, The West Wing was winning its second Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series, along with seven other Emmys. The show was a hit. But in its success, the wheels were beginning to come off the cart. In July of that same year, actors Allison Janney, John Spencer, Bradley Whitford, and Richard Schiff came together, demanding equal raises and threatened to not show up for work until they got them a tactic popularized by the cast of Friends. In July 2001, Aaron Sorkin had a row with Rick Cleveland, one of the writers for The West Wing, on an internet forum. In it, Sorkin claimed he threw out Cleveland's script for what became the episode Excelsius Deo, when in fact, Cleveland was largely responsible for the A story that followed Toby. Then there was Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe was always set apart from the rest of the cast, as an already established star, there was a kind of What is the play and what is my part? to his inclusion on the show. Even though Lowe had initially offered half his rate, he was still getting paid more than the other cast members, except for Martin Sheen. And in addition, there was some sort of understanding that his role in the show would be more prominent, hence the top billing and Sam-heavy storylines in the initial season. We are in desperate want of a Mercutio net. A young nobleman of Verona. Mm -hmm. And the title of this piece? Mercutio. Is it? I will play. Though, as the show progressed, Lowe's role was less prominent in favor of a more ensemble piece. As the actors around him received raises, Lowe received none. Which would have been acceptable to Lowe if his character could have more prominent roles as was initially discussed. But that didn't happen either. The behind the scenes of the show was never easy, but there were growing tensions. Warner Brothers' chief concern was how much more money the show could make, while executive producer and director Tommy Schlamy was only concerned with how good he could make the show. Tommy would often go over budget for an episode he was directing, because he believed that money invested into a show being better would yield greater returns in the end. But this difference in outlook for the show put Schlamy and Warner Brothers at odds, so Schlamy and Sorkin began to discuss their departure. According to John Wells, Rob Lowe began to frustrate Sorkin to the point that Sorkin wanted to fire him but certain members of the studio were a fan of Lowe and refused. Likewise, Sorkin refused the suggestion from the studio that he should not write all the episodes so that they could save money. By refusing, Aaron Sorkin effectively quit. I think I have to talk a bit about seasons five to seven after Aaron Sorkin, Tommy Schlamy, and Rob Lowe left the show. In their absence, John Wells took over the show and from season six onward, made Alex Graves and Christopher Missiano executive producers. A lot of fans don't like seasons five to seven as much as the first four seasons. Some fans don't even consider them part of the series at all. For many years, I had only seen the first four seasons, so I wasn't even aware of the change in the show. It wasn't until preparing for this video that I finished the rest of the series. And there's a kind of darkness to some of the final seasons. Even from the very end of season 4, which I know is still Sorkin days, and is still Alex Graves directing, just feels so contrary to what had come before. There's an ugliness to it. Even though they are tonally different scenes, look at this. Compared to this. I'm Joe Bethersonton. That's one T and with an H in there. And later this... I'll need your successor in place before you leave. Compared to this... That was awfully nice of you. I know that Zoe being kidnapped and returned is going to have quite a fallout, but everything afterward for a time feels so... bleak. Josh basically loses his job, Toby tries to resign, Leo just... loses the plot. He almost seems like a witness to the world going on around him instead of being able to make effective change. And I don't even know what to say about the Bartlets. 
On The Sopranos, Tony and Carmela swept aside many of their issues for multiple seasons, but it led to something. On The West Wing, Abby is so mad at Jed that she isn't talking to him, and then she suddenly shows up again, and they what, don't talk about their issues? It's not all bad, but there are definitely times when it is very dark and almost uncomfortable to see the characters we love and who love each other fight and hate one another. I'm not saying that I need my characters to love each other all the time, but it feels almost foreign to the show. Seasons 6 and 7 became almost entirely about the next election between Matthew Santos, played by Jimmy Smits, and Senator Arnold Vinnick, played by Alan Alda. Matt Santos is the new hope for the show. He's the underdog mostly making his following by his compelling speeches, which are built on his passion for education. Senator Vinnick is a political titan. Leo describes what a Vinnick campaign looks like before it begins, as though it was legendary. He's extremely likable and takes a high ground, mutual respect approach to almost everything he does. Even though the show sides Matt Santos with Josh Lyman, which gives us an added boost or incentive for the audience to cheer for him, it feels like the characters are structured so that you won't feel particularly bad if either opponent wins. What I love about their characters is how they kind of match the actors playing them. Alan Alda starred on one of the greatest TV shows of all time, MASH, and continued having a successful career in television, films, and Broadway, garnering multiple awards and nominations on each stage. Jimmy Smits gained notoriety for his roles on LA Law and NYPD Blue, and to me at least, became this proven actor who briefly joined your show and killed it. Like his role on a season of Dexter that apparently I am alone in appreciating. He has this line he keeps using on the season where he intensely clasps his hands together to show his and Dexter's unity. We're not in this alone, huh? It's you and me. Together. I love it. Both actors are such powerhouses in their own way, and it adds an additional dynamic to appreciating the character's conflict. But even still, there were so many great moments in those final seasons. Like the ending of the episode in Season 6, Faith-Based Initiative. I can't imagine how it must feel for someone with MS to watch The West Wing. To not only see those with your disease on TV, but to see them as powerful, capable, and accepted. Gail Kerr of the National MS Society commented, For the first time on national television or even in film, the public encountered a lead character with both an MS diagnosis and the hope for a continued productive life. Because The West Wing is a fictional drama and not a medical documentary, writers could have greatly distorted MS facts to further their storyline, but did not. The closest I can come to understanding is my experience with my father. In the last years of his life, my father suffered from a neurological disease. I watched as he gradually lost his balance and his ability to walk or stand. In season six, when the president's MS began affecting his ability to walk or stand, I couldn't help but think of my father. The only difference being there was no chance of my father standing or walking again. But to see Bartlett struggling to walk and regain balance in season six, while Matt Santos makes a speech about hope, just for a moment felt like I could watch my father walk again. I am sure that I'll have my share of false starts in this campaign, but there is no such thing as false hope. There is only hope. There's a precious space media can occupy in our hearts. It can take those moments of our lives that are real and merge them with make-believe. When executed right, there can be a symbiosis between media and our memories, our thoughts, and the emotions of our lives. To take our negative experiences and feelings and temporarily release them. At its worst, TV can be a crutch that impedes our purpose and lives, but at its best, it can help us look at the wounds in our heart that weigh us down and help us rise. He said, what's next? I have a friend who lives in the United States. We've been online friends for about 10 years. We both had webcomics in 2010 and started emailing each other with shop talk before messaging each other. I live in Canada and we mostly talk about our creative efforts or how to best promote them, but from time to time we talk about America. He lives in Florida so sometimes it's checking to see if he's okay with whatever hurricane is bearing down. On rare occasions it's about politics. I sometimes make him like a spokesperson for his country, which I know is silly, but we're silly people and I mean no disrespect. 
Earlier this year, I sent him a message. Dude, is your country okay? He said he didn't know. I'm not sure if I made him uncomfortable, so I didn't pursue it any further. Then a few months later, I told him I was working on a video about the West Wing. I told him, I think America could use a little hope right now. He said, you better hurry. We might not be here when you're done. We joke around a lot. It's almost the foundation of our conversations. But there was something about his dark humor I can't shake. We might not be here when you're done. I spent far too long trying to write a script that not only addressed the West Wing's ideals, its history, and the structure of its gears and its heart, but that could also address just some of the unending pain that seems to be rife in America right now. Tonight, U.S. cases of coronavirus more than doubling. It's with worst closing day uh, since 1987. 148 thousand people applied for unemployment assistance during the last full week of March. We're now talking about 22 million people just in the last four weeks. Finally, It's all become soberingly familiar in this country. So, too, the action that sparked it. 320, we're This. That's his name! John Blood! That's his name! John Blood! People are sick of watching black men murdered. Americans have been struggling to pay for housing costs. In July 2020, an estimated 32% of Americans missed a rent or mortgage payment. That and was when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, mm -hmm. make sure you say son. Overnight, multiple wildfires exploding in Southern California. Hurricane force winds driving these flames in Orange County as 150,000 residents are warned to Parking evacuate. The lot of AT&T Stadium in Texas is enormous but it's still not large enough to hold all of the cars coming for food ahead of Thanksgiving. I think I was trying to convey a message that would offer a kind of hope. We live in cynical times. I know that. But hope is not up for debate. You know, just something hopeful in a day that might feel hopelessly and endlessly challenging. I don't know if I achieved that. I don't know if the West Wing can achieve that anymore. I just wanted you to know that I love you. And I tried. Over the course of seven years, a lot of things changed about the show. But the one thing it retained was the idea that, in all of us, there is a willingness and ability to help one another. No one gets left behind. These sentiments encircle the West Wing. Not just a government that was working to do its best for its citizens, but a group of people working for them and for each other, ceaselessly. If you were in an accident, I wouldn't stop for a beer. If you were in an accident, I wouldn't stop for red lights. A group of characters and actors and creators where the bonds of family and friendship have no borders. What this lady She's does. She's incapable. It's incapable. incapable. And she will say something totally unrelated and we're caught. America still has tremendous challenges in its way and a long, unforgiving road. But the West Wing believes that America is a country where the way things are initially given to us cannot be the final word about them. That we can never settle for that. This is a time for American heroes. We will do what is hard. We will achieve what is great. That if we work on our problems, together, we stand a fighting chance. You got a dollar? Take it out. Look at the back, the seal, the pyramid. It's unfinished. With the eye of God looking over it and the words Anuit Coeptis, he, God, favors our undertaking. The seal is meant to be unfinished because this country is meant to be unfinished. We're meant to keep doing better. Because as difficult as today's America is, there's always tomorrows. They're saying all the federal government money. And you don't even need a stamp. Hand it over. She seems to be a very good secretary. Well, she'll be happy to hear that. She's standing right outside the door. Ow, your voice sounds very familiar to me. I do radio commercials for products. Sorry. Why were you in the closet? I had to pee. They won't let me smoke inside, but you can pee in Leo's closet. Mr. President. 